All right, welcome back. I'm Robert Breaker, and we're continuing our verse by verse Bible study through the book of uh, 1 Peter. We're in chapter 5 now. I'm excited about it. This is the last chapter of the book of 1 Peter. Next time, when we finish chapter 5, I don't know, this might take one class, it might take two, maybe even three. I've got seven pages of notes. I've been studying this again. This is one of my favorite books, 1 Peter. And I've told you before that much of the book of 1 Peter is milk. And a lot of 2 Peter is meat. So I can't wait to get to 2 Peter and see all the heavy doctrines. But right now it's just basically uh, milk for, for new Christians. It's all about learning how to live in this world and suffer. Because unfortunately we live in a world of suffering. And people all the time suffer. And it's a horrible thing. But of course that's what the book of Job is about. Why do the righteous suffer? When you're saved, God imputes to you his righteousness. Well, the devil hates that. The devil hates that. And so the devil loves to attack Christians, and he does. And uh, what we're supposed to do as Christians is realize, look, the worst that can happen to us will never, ever, ever compare to what happened to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I tell you what, that's what gets me through is remembering what Jesus suffered for me. And I always think to myself, well, if Jesus could suffer what he suffered on the cross for me and for my sins, when I certainly do not deserve his love and affection and grace and mercy, then the least I can do is suffer for him because he suffered for me. So that's what 1 Peter is all about, is, is suffering. And I've shown you the verses before, all the different places where it says suffer, suffer, suffer. Matter of fact, in verse uh, 16 of chapter 4, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. So if we are suffering, and Paul said it well, Paul said, Yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So if you're saved and you're living for the Lord, there's no prosperity gospel where God's just going to shower you with millions of dollars because you're a super spiritual Christian. That's not how it works. Oftentimes, the more spiritual you are, the more closer you are to Jesus, the more you're doing for God, the more you will be attacked and ridiculed and mocked and put down, and the more you suffer. But we're supposed to glorify God. We're supposed to say, look, it's all about you, Jesus. It's not about me, and I appreciate you and what you've done. And get closer to the Lord. Suffering really does bring us closer to the Lord, as we'll see when we eventually get to verse 10. There's a reason that we suffer. And we're supposed to learn from it and grow from it. And that's the desire of Peter, and that's the desire of the Lord. So let's begin here in chapter 5 and verse 1. And he says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder... And a witness of the sufferings of Christ, again, talking about suffering, the whole book he's talking about suffering. A witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Now, I can't stop there because it's a semicolon. Feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. And I can't stop there because it's a uh, semicolon. The other one was a colon. This is a semicolon. So verse 3 says, Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. Okay, so let's start here in verse 1. And what I see here is Peter is talking to the elders. Now, who are the elders? Well, if you read your Bible and you read the New Testament, whenever they were able to get people saved in a certain place, they would set up a local church. The local church is those that got saved in a certain area. And they would meet together every week. On Sunday, not Saturday. I can show you that in the Bible. Jesus rose the first day of the week, a Sunday. And then we have the early church meeting a week later on the Sunday. And then later meeting on Sunday, we see Paul uh, telling them to uh, lay in store for Sunday an offering. So we have Sunday worship from the very beginning of the church age. All right, There's people out there, the Seventh-day Adventists, that say, no, you got to keep the Sabbath. Yet they conveniently omit Exodus 31. And Exodus 31 says the Sabbath is for Israel as a token and as a sign for their generations forever. And there's capital punishment on it. If you don't keep the Sabbath, you are to be killed. Okay? So we are not under the Old Testament. We are not under the Sabbath anymore. Because the Sabbath was uh, die. 
So the Sabbath was for Jews to keep under penalty of death. Today in the New Testament, we go uh, Sunday, and we remember Sunday because Jesus rose again on a Sunday. As soon as it turned Sunday morning, Jesus rose again. And throughout the New Testament, we see people going to church, uh, a meeting together on a Sunday. Now these Seventh-day Adventists, they'll lie to you. They'll say, no, that didn't start till three or four hundred years later, and a pope said, let's start Sunday worship. No, in the Bible, they're meeting on the first day of the week. You see, this is the seventh day of the week, Sabbath. That's, what, what's, that's our modern Saturday, the last day of the week. Sunday is the first day of the week. So we got to get a hold of that, okay? So the people then, that when they met together on the Sunday, because it's all about the sun, Jesus is the sun. I know it's spelled differently, S-O-N-S-U-N. But when they met on Sunday, there was someone who was in charge of the service, Someone who led the service. Someone who said, okay, everybody come around, and he was the speaker. And he says, all right, so we're going to preach today. And there was oftentimes more than one. That's why it's called elders, plural. He says, I'm an elder, but there's more than one elder. And so in the church, there's literally seven offices. And I didn't put this in my... Um, book. I, I do have this available, the books of First and Second Peter, my commentary. I've only written a couple of commentaries. I wish I had more time and I could have done commentaries on the entire Bible. And you can get that from uh, the bookstore at thecloudchurch.org or my, or my old website, RRB3, Robert Ray Breaker III, RRB3.com. Now, in the Bible we have the church. And in the church, the control is by men. There are no women pastors, no women preachers, no women deacons in the Bible. Unfortunately, today, they've changed Bibles and changed it to where it has diaconisa in Spanish, woman deacon. That's not what it says in the original uh, Greek language. That's not what it says in the King James Bible. That's not, someone has perverted that to give you a woman. Matter of fact, uh, in the Bible it says, I suffer not a woman to teach or you serve authority over a man. So there's no women pastors or things like that in the Bible. Now, some women will say, well, that makes me sad because I want to teach. Well, you can teach the younger children and you can teach women. And so in the Bible, it is okay for a woman to teach a woman and to teach children. But in the Bible, it is not okay that a woman teaches a man. And that's in uh, Timothy. We've gone over that before. So look at this. And this is what I'll call, well, seven, um, I don't even know what to call it, seven church rulers, I guess, or, or, or seven, I'll just put seven offices. I hate to use that term offices because many Baptists say there's only two offices in the local church. Well, uh, so maybe I'll just put parentheses, maybe office isn't the right word. But in the Bible, there are seven different people who are men who go around and do the work of the Lord as a ministry. Uh, uh, let me, you know what, I'll, I'll just use the word ministry. That would be the best thing. Seven ministries. And these are ministries in which God calls a person to be in. In order to minister to the body of Christ, the church. The first is the pastor. Okay, we call him a pastor. The second is an overseer. Now, a lot of these terms we may not use today. But they're in the Bible, and some of them mean the same thing. But it's just interesting that there's seven different words to talk about. Ruler and elder. And we're going to look at elder. We've got also in a, a deacon and evangelist. All right, now let's look at this. Now, some people might say, well, where's missionary? Well, the word missionary is not in the Bible. Now, that doesn't mean you can't be a missionary. You can. But I would put a missionary more under evangelist because what is the work of a missionary? He's supposed to go preaching the gospel. You see, evangel, evangelio, is the word in Spanish for gospel. Euangelion is the word from Greek, and I don't like running to the Greek. But that's where the word evangel or, um, comes from, evangelist is someone who's supposed to be out there giving the evangelio, giving the evangelio, giving the gospel. So there's your missionary. Now, a lot of people say, Brother Breaker, why do you call yourself a missionary evangelist? Well, the reason is, I, uh, 
was on a mission board for years, and then I realized you don't need a mission board, so thank God I don't have one. But uh, I was out of many churches, and I'd go to churches, and I'd say, God's called me to be a missionary to Honduras. Well, God used me there, started two churches, and now God's using me in, in other ways in different places. So when I went around, people said, oh, you're a missionary, you're a missionary. Well, everybody and their grandmother likes to call themselves a missionary nowadays, and you know the word missionary supposedly means one cent. Okay, and so it's okay to use the term missionary. I'm not against the word missionary, but sent to do what? I noticed is when I got to Honduras as a missionary, there were a lot of people running around calling themselves missionaries, but they weren't preaching the gospel. And many of them were what you call a social uh, missionary or a medical missionary or this kind of missionary or that. And their focus wasn't getting people saved. A lot of them, their focus was just helping somebody with medicine. Well, what good is it if you heal somebody's body, but then they die and their soul goes to hell? You see, this whole thing is about winning souls. And so a true missionary is one who is sent to evangelize, to preach the gospel. So I started to call myself a missionary evangelist because, yes, I'm sent. God sent me as a missionary to do the work of the Lord, but to do what? To evangelize. So I like missionary evangelist because the word evangelist is in the Bible, and I'm going to show you that here in a minute. But um, a lot of people have asked that. Why do you call yourself a missionary evangelist? Because the focus is the gospel, evangelizing, preaching, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, how that Christ died, preaching the blood-stained gospel, not a modern bloodless gospel. So the first thing we see here, and uh, let me go ahead and just put the verses up here, and then we'll go through each one. The term pastor. So today, this is the term that we use the most when we talk about someone who has been elected, if you will, who's been voted on to become the pastor of a church. And usually that's what it's all about. You've got to be voted by the body of Christ. Now, people might say, well, Brother Breaker, you're a pastor. Well, I'm more a missionary evangelist. I don't really call myself a pastor. I'm more of a Bible teacher. But some people, they say, well, I can't find a church, Brother Breaker. You're the only church we can find online, so you're my pastor. Okay, that's fine. A pastor goes back to sheep. A pastor is someone who takes care of sheep. And that's what it's supposed to be. So there's involved in being a pastor is as a caring for people. You're supposed to care. I've met people that claim to be a pastor, and they hate people. They despise people. They use the title pastor but they use it to get on a soapbox to just put people down and attack and name call and ridicule. And I say, well, that's not a pastor. <laughs> that's not really a pastor. And not somebody that, that is really a pastor. But anyway, let me write up here all the verses that we're going to go through them, okay? Uh, I want you to see this. And really, these are all the same thing, okay? From here to here. A pastor and an overseer and a bishop and the ruler and the church and the elder, they're all really synonymous. They're the same thing. Then you have a deacon, and the pastor's in the church, the deacon's in the church. The evangelist is somebody who is surrendered to go out of the church to go start new churches or to win people to the Lord, and, and so he's sent out of the church. Paul, we could say, was an evangelist. All right, so we got bishop here. For, let me write these up here real quick, because I, I want you to have this in your Bible in order to help people with it. Philippians 1.1. 1, 1. All right, now ruler. Wow, there's a lot on this one. So there's a lot of scriptures, but I just want to make sure we go through each one and you uh, see this. Now, my Bible is full of notes, and I always recommend that you take notes in your Bible. And uh, I hope you do that. Uh, let's see. First Timothy three, four through five, and then five seventeen. All right, Elder. Acts fourteen twenty three fifteen two four six twenty two four twenty seventeen. Man, I got a lot on this one. <laughs> 21, 18, Miami won't go through all of them, but you can look some of these up yourself if I choose to skip over them. I mean, um, let's see, evangelist. I switched those two around, so let me make sure I do this right. Evangelist, Acts 21, 8. 
and well, I have a whole lot more list here from elders, but I'm gonna, if we do, I'll just read them. And then the deacon, 1 Timothy 3, 8, 12, and 13. Okay. So here's what we have is the seven different words that the Bible uses when it comes to ministries in the Bible. Now, there's still another one, and I haven't even gone there, but that's the ministry of a teacher. But it seems like the teacher is also supposed to be a preacher. So a teacher and a preacher. And you really have to be able to do teaching if you're a pastor or an evangelist. So I didn't write this one up here because I feel like it's included in this. Even a deacon should be able to teach the Bible. But teacher and a preacher. So you, you need to be able to do both. Be able to preach the Bible and teach the Bible if you're one of these. And again, this is a, a ministry and this is really something that God calls a Christian into. Yes, you can desire to be it as well. And there are some people that desire to be pastors, and they pray about it and say, Lord, I, I desire the office of a deacon or the office of... So deacon and pastor is called an office. And you can be one because you want to. But there really needs to be a calling of God in your life to call you into the ministry. Uh, I've met people that were pastors that I don't believe God called them to be pastors. Matter of fact, some of them I don't even think are saved. <laughs> I hate to say that. As a matter of fact, I remember several times in my life when I visited a church and the pastor told me, well, I pastored here for 11 years and I wasn't even saved. I had that false gospel. And uh, I was reading my Bible one day and I saw it's all about the blood. And I realized, you know what? My whole life I haven't been trusting in the blood. I've been trusting in what I did. And I got saved. And I told the church. And, uh, well, they, they said, well, you know the Bible, so we'll keep you on as pastor. And they did. Um, another guy that the church voted him out <laughs> said, well, you can't be the pastor if you just got saved. Well, he knew a lot before he got saved, and I think he probably could have continued on as the pastor. He was just deceived. There's a lot of people out there in religion that are lost, and they have a false gospel, and many of them have false Bibles. But we need to get the right gospel, the right Bible, and the right teaching and then teach it to others, and that's what it's all about. So let's go through each one of these. Let's look up the verses. Let me show you these in the Bible. Ephesians 4. Verse 11, Ephesians 4.11 says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers, okay, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. So that's what it's about. It's about ministering. Okay, that's why I called it a ministry. But it's also about edifying. What is edifying? To build up, to teach, to, to help, not to hinder. A lot of people claim to be pastors, and all they do is put people down, tear people down, and attack them. That's not what it's for. Verse 12 says, For the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, I noticed that it mentioned prophets. And some people said, but Brother Brinker, what about a prophet? Well, in the early church, as it's a transition from Jew to Gentile, um, from Israel to the church, from Peter to Paul, you know, and that as you go through the book of Acts, in the early book of Acts, there are some people that are prophets. But when Paul is there, eventually we get the entire Bible. And when we get the entire canon of Scripture, there's no more need now to have someone that's a prophet. The Bible tells us, and we read it in Peter, uh, or did we read it? Yeah, I think we. Did? Let me see. Maybe it's in Second Peter. Yeah, it's in Second Peter. Second Peter. We haven't read it yet. Second Peter, uh, one nineteen says, speaking of the Bible, we have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. So the Bible talks about the Bible itself being our more sure word of prophecy. More sure than what? Verse eighteen. A voice from heaven. So in the early book of Acts, before the, the Bible was complete, God still used prophets. But when the Bible became complete, in a complete canon, then God said, now there's no more need for a prophet, because this, the Bible, is our more sure word of prophecy. More sure than a voice from heaven. So I don't need to go to a man and say, hey, tell me, what does God say? 
And then him say, well, God's speaking to me. Hold on. He says this, that, and the other thing. That doesn't happen anymore nowadays. God doesn't speak to people to tell us things like he did with the prophets in the Old Testament and in the early book of Acts. We have the Bible. It's our more sure word of prophecy. So we don't go around asking people, what do you think? Well, God's speaking to me, and he says, no, I don't see that. I don't see God speaking to us nowadays like he did in the Old Testament through his voice or through an angel. Matter of fact, Paul says, if an angel comes, he's accursed, and he preaches to you. So I, I am very careful of listening to men that say they're prophets. Because I have the prophecy of the scripture. And oftentimes, many times, matter of fact, I told you when I was in the Assembly of God church before I got saved and I was in that church, men would stand up and say, I'm a prophet. I'm a prophet. Oh, wait, wait, wait. God's talking to me. He's saying this, that, and the other thing. And it didn't come to pass. Well, what does the Bible say in the Old Testament if a man prophesies and it doesn't come to pass? You were supposed to stone him <laughs> because he said, God said this and he didn't say it. And you lied in the name of God. So you basically said, God's a liar. And God was very angry with people that did that in the Old Testament. He said they ought to be stoned. So in the New Testament, you've got to be careful and you've got to rightly divide. You've got to know your Bible. And in the Bible, it appears that there's no more prophets in the church because there's no need for them. We have the finished canon. We have all the prophecy we need in the Bible. And no man is going to go, well, oh, let me add to that type thing. You've got to be careful of that. So I don't go by prophets, I go by scriptures. And if someone says something, line it up with the Bible. Make sure it lines up with the Bible, because more times than not, they'll say something, and, and they'll say, God told me this. And you go, oh, really, really, uh-huh. And you listen to it, and you look at the Bible, and the Bible says something else. So it wasn't God. A lot of times it's the devil trying to deceive people. So watch out for people that claim to be prophets, okay? Same thing with the apostles. There were apostles in the early church. There are no apostles today. And you know what? We'll get to that in this study. Maybe not this class, but next class. We'll look at how there's no apostles today. Yeah, maybe there will be this class. We'll see. So these were in the early church, but they're not here today. Now it's just this. Okay? So uh, there we go. Pastor. Okay? So we find the term pastor. Now let's look at overseer. Acts 20, 28. So I just want to go through this list, show you in the Bible these names, and these are different names of someone that is in the local church who is a minister. Acts 20, 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. All right. So Paul is speaking, and he says, hath made you overseers. So he's writing to someone here who is a pastor, and he's calling them an overseer. So another name for a pastor is an overseer, someone who oversees what's going on and kind of behind the scenes takes care of everything. And so he's the one that says, okay, we're going to have this meeting on this time. Uh, we're going to meet together on this day. I'll be preaching or so-and-so will be preaching or so-and-so. And, and that's what they did. They kind of directed the, uh, the assembly. In the service. Okay, now let's look at 1 Timothy 3. Let's go to Bishop, 1 Timothy chapter 3. Now, this is a term that many Catholics love. And the Catholic Church has, has hijacked a lot of these words, and uh, they are, are trying to take over these things. So they love to have the word bishop. But they have a hierarchy, the pope, the archbishop, the bishop, and the priest. But where's a priest in the New Testament? The Bible says we are priests of Christ. So the priests are in the Old Testament. Imagine some guy running around calling himself a priest today. What is he doing? He is confessing that he doesn't even know his Bible because the priests were for the Old Testament, not for today. Jesus is our priest. He's our high priest. We don't need a priest a man. We have the man, Christ Jesus, who died for our sins. So you got to watch out for the Romanist church that uh, tries to make you think that your salvation is dependent upon a priest and you got to go to him and let him do things for you in order to save you. That's, that's a slap in the face to Jesus because Jesus says, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Come to Jesus and his blood for salvation, not to a man. Not to a person who's who's uh, really, I shouldn't say it, but I will, a Baalite priest. If you begin to study the Roman religion, it goes back to Baal. It goes back to Babylon. And the things that they do in the Roman church go back to 
ancient Babylonian practices in which the Baalite priests, they, they did confession. They baked cakes to their sun god, and they ate them. Sounds like the mass. And they said, we're eating our god. Well, you go to the Romanist church, they said, we're eating our god. You don't eat Jesus Christ. You receive him by faith. So, <clears throat> First Timothy chapter 3 and uh, verse 1. So, I don't use the terms that they use, okay? And, and many of us today, we don't even use the term bishop when we talk about a, a, a pastor. Because we don't want to be identified with that crowd. I think it's interesting. But it is in the Bible. Um, 1 Timothy 3, 1. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desires the good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. Okay? So where does that leave a woman? Can a woman be a bishop? Can a woman be a pastor? Uh, no. No. A, a pastor, a bishop, has to be married to one wife. Um, if he's not, then he's not a bishop. It's just the Bible gives you rules. Um, and then it continues on there. Um, go to Titus 1 7. Titus 1 7. Titus chapter 1 verse 7 says, For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality. Now look back at verse 5 there. Ordain elders in every city. So an elder is a bishop. So a pastor, a bishop, an elder. All the same thing, an overseer, a ruler. And it can be more than one. A lot of churches have one pastor, and that's it. Uh, some churches have a pastor and assistant pastor. I don't see assistant pastor in the Bible. In the Bible, I see elders. It sounds like there's three, four, five, six guys, possibly, that are co-pastors of a church. Not one in particular that's above all others. When I read the Bible and I look at that and I see, oh, elders. So there's, oh, so there's like four or five men that are, that are working for the betterment of the people in the congregation. And they're, they're running things from behind the scenes. And I guess that's better than just one man. Because uh, why? Because one man can become a dictator and do bad things. And boy, if you're a, an independent Baptist or a Baptist, you've seen church splits, most likely. You've seen churches have splits. And sometimes it's the fault of the congregation hating the pastor and wanting to do something evil against him, and he's a good man. Or sometimes he's a very, very bad man, and he's trying as a dictator to run the thing, and the people say, well, that's it, we're done, and they leave. And it's very sad to see uh, either the congregation is evil or the pastor is evil, and, and what damage that can do, and that's really, really sad. God is looking for godly men to do this, not ungodly men. All right, so now let's go to Philippians 1.1 1, 1, real quick. Philippians, I believe it's Philippians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. So with the bishops and the deacons. Now in the local church, there were always pastors, bishops, and then there were deacons. Now deacon is a little different, and I'll show you that. Um, a deacon is basically a helper in the church. But yet, if the pastor can't preach, well, then the deacon fills in. And the deacon needs to be ready to be able to teach at any time. Now, in our modern way of doing things, if you go to a brick-and-mortar church, usually you go to church, and many of your traditional ones will have a 10 to 11 service, which is like what they call Sunday school, and then 11 to 12 service, which they call regular service. And then many of them will have an evening ser service at either 6 or 7 o'clock. Well, Sunday school is not in the Bible. That came about probably 100 years ago. And some churches said, you know, we want not just to preach every Sunday, we need to teach. And so they set up what they called Sunday school. And, and I don't have a problem with it. You know, it's not in the Bible, but it's not a bad thing to go and listen to teaching. And many pastors I've met will teach Sunday school and regular service. But then I've met a lot of other pastors that will have a man in the church teach the Sunday school, and then the pastor will come and preach the Sunday service. And many of the men that are teaching the Sunday school are the deacons in the church. Now, not always, but many are. So a deacon is really somebody who maybe wants to be a pastor eventually, but you got to start somewhere. And you got to be apt to teach if you're a pastor, so best place to start is start as a deacon teaching the Bible. And so there's, there's a lot of churches that do things differently, a lot of different customs. But what I'm doing today is just trying to show you what the Bible calls the, the ministries or the minister. And these are different names for a pastor 
There's also a deacon, and then there's an evangelist, which, which I would classify as a missionary. So I'll just put missionary. In a lot of churches, they support a missionary and send them out to go start other churches in other places. Now, that was what? That was our bishop. Okay, now let's look at ruler. Let's go to Hebrews. The book of Hebrews. Now, here is the, the word ruler. Hebrews 13, 7. Hebrews 13 and verse 7. Remember them which have the rule over you, have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Who is he talking to? Some people try to say, well, he's talking to those that have the rule over you, so he's talking to politicians and you. And he's saying, submit yourselves to the politicians. And I look at that and go, well, most of the politicians in Washington are Catholics, so I'm supposed to follow their faith? I don't think so. No, Paul's not speaking here in Hebrews of follow all the Masons in, in Washington, D.C. He's not saying that and their false faith. He's talking about those that rule over you spiritually in the church, that are, that are in charge of the church. Let me show you that again in verse 17. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable to you. So it's the spiritual leadership of the church. And the pastor's there because he cares about the people and he wants to see their souls saved. Now, if they are saved, well, then they're family and they're having kids. Well, those kids need to hear the gospel and get saved too. So a pastor should care about the salvation of the people in this church, whether they're really saved or not. And if they are saved, he's trying to teach them how to be a good, godly Christian person so that people will grow. Look at verse um, 24 here in Hebrews 13. Salute all them that have the rule over you and all the saints. They of Italy salute you. So here are the rulers of the church, which would be what? The bishop, the overseer, the pastor. That's who it is, one of the elders. Okay? Now let's go to um, 1 Timothy 3, 4. So I just wanted to give you this, and I uh, hope it's a blessing to you, and, and say this also, we are in the last days. I truly believe we are about right here, and here is the rapture. So we are that close to the rapture of the church, and things today are not what they used to be. Used to you could go to a, a church. Nowadays with COVID-19 and things like that, they're locking down churches and saying, oh, you can't go to church anymore. And people tell me all the time, all over the world, there's no more good churches. Now, there are some, thank God for that. But I get phone calls, emails, uh, letters from the Netherlands, from Sweden, from Switzerland, from uh, you know Middle East, from, from uh, uh, down south. I even got a couple from China. And they're like, Brother Breaker, I can't find a good church. They don't exist anymore. The only churches that are left are the Catholics and the cults. Jehovah Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, um, Calvinists, things like that. Where is a good Bible-believing church that's King James and that teaches the gospel correctly? Where is it? Well, people ask me, Brother Breaker, what are you? I'm an ordained independent Baptist minister, okay? I graduated from the Pensacola Bible Institute, which was an independent Baptist Bible school. And there's my diploma. I have to say that because some people lie and say, well, Brother Breaker never, never graduated Bible school. I'm like, well... Where did I get the diploma? A Cracker Jack box? No, I was there for graduation. I think you can even go and, and buy the graduation service um, from the bookstore, kjv1611.org, if I remember right. If you want to have some fun, um, buy the uh, watch night service where I preached one night there in the church. That was kind of fun. I preached on God's arm is stretched out or something like that. But here is my ordination paper. And I was ordained. Actually, I've been ordained like three different times. But ordained as an independent Baptist. So I am what you call an independent Baptist, I guess. Now, unfortunately, in the last five, ten years, many independent Baptist churches are going downhill fast into apostasy. And I hate that, and I, I just don't like that. Some of them are departing from the Bible and are not using the true Word of God. Some of them are departing from the true gospel and preaching a bloodless gospel, and I don't like that. Some of them are falling into sin. It's very common, unfortunately, to hear of pastors that have molested children or fallen into adultery or some s s horrible thing. But for many years, many, many years ago, uh, the independent Baptists were the only denomination that was the closest to the Bible. But that and, let's see, 
uh, Bible church. There, there was one called a Bible church. I think Plymouth Brethren or something like that. Those were the denominations that were closest. But you got to kind of watch out for those other ones too. So people ask me all the time in emails, Brother Breaker, I want to go to a church, but I don't know what to look for. What church should I go to? And I say, well, I guess look for an independent Baptist church. They're the closest to the Bible. But uh, some of them are very, very critical, spirited, and I don't like that. And that's not biblical. We're supposed to be caring and kind and loving. It's all about ministering. And so people ask me, where do I go? And I say, go here, and I'll put it up here. I say, the place that I found is fundamental.org. Fundamental.org. That's a website that is supposed to be King James Bible-believing independent Baptist churches all over the world. So if you're somewhere in the world and, and you're coming and watching my videos all the time, thecloudchurch.org, and I'm glad you do, I hope you're learning, but you feel like, well, I want fellowship with other Christians. All right, go here, fundamental.org, and see if there's one close to you. Uh, several people told me, well, there's four or five on the list close to me. I say, okay, try out every single one and find the one that is the best. Because, sadly, some of them aren't that great. I've had several people tell me, well, Brother Breaker, there was three on the list. I went to the first one for a couple months, went to the second one for a couple months, and it was just grieving my spirit. They just weren't right. They don't preach like you do. And then I went to the third one, and it was like, oh, I'm home. I found, just like Robert Breaker, they preach the gospel, they preach the Bible, they teach the truth. So there still are some good churches, not a lot. So like I'm saying, when I give you this, I don't know those churches on the list. All I know is someone said, there's the fundamental.org, there's the King James Bible believing churches that are left in the world. Now the question is, are they good or not? <laughs> but if you're looking for a local church, this should be a list all over the world of uh, Bible believing churches. Supposed to be. I say supposed to be. You never know. Sometimes a guy dies as pastor, another guy comes in and runs it into a ground. Uh, some guy, sometimes a guy starts out right and well, he falls into apostasy and runs the church down. So you've got to go, and you've got to discern for yourself. All right, sit on. I always tell people just sit in the back and be quiet and listen for a couple of months, and see if this is the kind of place that God wants you to be, because they can offer you something that I can't, and that's fellowship. And one of the things that the early church did when they met together is they all fellowshiped with each other. You got to remember what it was like during the time of Peter and Paul in the early, or well, toward the book of Acts, the early church. The whole world was against them, all right? When, when Jesus died and rose again, the early apostles went out preaching, and who was against them? The Jews. And they were persecuted, Acts 8 1. So the Jews were persecuting Christians. Then Paul gets out, starts winning all these Gentiles. Of course, you know, Peter was the first to win a Gentile and some Gentiles. But Paul went out, and so Paul's getting people saved, and, and Christianity is flourishing, and then Rome says, no, nah, we don't like you guys, and they start killing Christians. And during the time of Peter and Paul, we see persecutions. We talked about that a couple times back, and how they were persecuted for their faith. So Christians, if you were a Christian back then, you're going through the whole week just, oh, the world's horrible. They hate me. They're trying to kill me. I, you, a lot of times you had to hide. From, from the officials that wanted to kill you. What was your crime? Nothing except saying only Jesus is God and all the Roman gods are devils, demons, fallen angels. And so that was your crime, not worshiping the same gods as the world. But when Sunday came and you all got together with other Christians, you threw all your cares behind you, said it's just so good to be with other Christians. And I love that. I, I love being with other Christians. And it's just so sad to me how hard it is to find other Christians nowadays. And when you do find some, they're not the kind of Christian they're supposed to be. Yes, they may be saved. Yes, they may have King James. Yes, they might be right on a lot of things. But then they're just hateful and mean-spirited. It's like, why can't we all be the way the Bible says? Com kind, compassionate, caring, loving. Why can't we edify one another. It's just it's so hard. So all I can do is just encourage you, try to find some other Christians to fellowship with. Because we all do need companionship. We all do need fellowship. We all do need friendship with other Christians. Alright, so where were we? We were looking at ruler, and we were supposed to go to 1 Timothy chapter 3, and verse 4 and 5. So speaking here about a ruler, 1 Timothy 3, 4 says, and it's speaking about a bishop, 
okay, a pastor. Verse 4 says, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. All right, so a man that's a pastor is supposed to have his children in subjection. Verse 5, for if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? So if a man is ruling his house well, well, if he's a pastor and he's in charge of the church, then he'll rule the church well. He'll be a good, godly man who's thinking of what's best for the congregation, not what's best for himself. Uh, 1 Timothy 5 and verse 17. 1 Timothy 5, 17. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. So the elders that rule well. So the elders are the rulers of the church. And what are they ruling over? Well, they're not, you know, dictators over the people. They're running the, the service in a way in which they're making sure that what's being preached from the pulpit is sound doctrine, not false doctrine. And Paul tells us and warns us about the times when people come into the church and they teach things that aren't true. And so a man who's the head of the church shouldn't do that. Shouldn't allow someone in to preach something that's not sound doctrine. All right, I wouldn't let a Mormon or a Jehovah Witness or a Seventh-day Adventist come to you on my channel because I've studied their doctrine and I say, no, no, that's not Bible doctrine. They might use the Bible, but they're not preaching it rightly divided. So I wouldn't allow that. I want to do right and make sure I bring to you sound doctrine all the time. Now, the last one is elder. Well, not the last one, but the last of the five that all refer to a pastor. Uh, elder. Let's go to Acts 14 to 23. Acts 14 23 says, And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. Okay, so in the early book of Acts, we see the early church going out and preaching what they're preaching. And people believe it, and they begin to come together every week in services, church services. And when they do, well, they, they say, all right, well, let's pick out of, of this group, who knows, what, 20 people, 500 people, I don't know. Let's pick out men that could, could, could lead this. Well, what did that entail? Well, they would be the ones that are there um, making sure that everyone is safe, making sure everyone has a seat, making sure uh, everyone has a copy of the Bible, uh, making sure that, that if they do speak more than one, that they do it in order and decently, like it says in, in 1 Corinthians 14. So they're, they're like the ushers, I guess. Uh, but Well, the deacons would be more like the ushers. But they're like the, the speakers, but they're also running things behind the scenes so that it, it can be done right and done decently, not chaos, right? Not, and making sure that they all follow the scriptures the way they are presented. Uh, 15.2, so you can go through here, 15.2, when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. Okay, so there's an elder. An elder is what? Well, it literally means an older person. An elder or a younger. Uh, I'm an elder now, I guess. I'll be 46 in a day or two. So I guess I'm an elder. I'm an older man. But it's not just the age, although age does bring experience, it's the knowledge and the understanding. And the more you learn the Bible, well, the more that now it falls on your shoulders to be the teacher to teach others. So I won't go on there, but these are all other verses about the elder and how the Bible uses the term elder more than it uses pastor, overseer, or bishop, or ruler. And I just find that interesting. Nowadays, we don't use the word elder. We just say pastor. Why? Well, because the Mormons came out. And the Mormons said, no, we're going to take that word. I, I just find it interesting that the, um, the, the Catholics said, well, we're going to take this word, word. And because of that, true Christians go, well, I guess we can't use it. And then along come the, 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 the Mormons, and the Mormons say, well, we're going to use that word. Oh, great. Well, now we can't use it. So mostly what we use today is pastor. And that's the most used term for someone who is the director of a church, the pastor. And uh, it's interesting that cults will, will hijack a word in the Bible, and now we're afraid to use it. <laughs> but have you ever met a, uh, a Mormon? They come to your house, you know, they knock on the door, and they're all like, Hello, I'm Elder So-and-so, and this is Elder So-and-so. We'd like to talk to you about Jesus Christ. We're from the Latter-day Saints. And you look at them, and they look like they're 20 years old or 16 years old. 
and you're like, and your name is Elder? <laughs> you're not an elder, you're a young boy. Uh, I've had several do that to me. They come to my house and they say, oh, we're from the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints, and we'd like to speak with you. I'm Elder so-and-so, and I'm Elder so-and-so. And I look at them and I go, no, you're not. And they go, I'm sorry, what? No, I'm Elder so-and-so. I said, you're not Elder. You're not my Elder. I'm older than you. Do you mind if I refer to you as younger from here on out? And they go, oh, well, no, no. And, and, you know, I don't want to be mean and talk down to them, right? But it's offensive to me that they're calling themselves an old man, an old learned man, when they're young men. I don't, I just don't like that. And uh, you try to talk to um, them, and oftentimes they only want to give you their side. They don't want to listen to the truth. So you need to pray for them. A lot of them, their doctrine comes from Joseph Smith. And if you haven't seen it yet, please go to YouTube and look up my video, Why I Am Not a Mormon. Uh, Joseph Smith and his mother and his father were, were into witchcraft. And uh, Joseph Smith began a uh, denomination from a false premise. You see, Paul says in Galatians, Though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, let him be accursed. Well, Joseph Smith pops up and says, Wow, this angel from heaven spoke to me and he gave me an, a new gospel. Well, that ought to tell you right there, I can't have anything to do with you because you just went against what Paul said in the Bible. So be careful of uh, cults and uh, be careful of their false doctrine. Evangelist. Let's go to Acts 21.8. Now, this is only used one time in the Bible. This word, evangelist, I believe. Acts 21 and verse 8. And the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip, the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. So here's an evangelist. And Philip was called an evangelist, so I would call this a missionary. Now, I don't have time to get into Philip, but I think when we went through Acts, we did talk a little bit about how he was one of the first ones to obey God and leave Jerusalem and go different places preaching. So he was really a missionary. The early church, uh, many of the early apostles, they, they just stayed in Jerusalem. And God said, no, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost part of the earth. They're supposed to be going and doing all this, but they're just staying in one place. So he was really one of the first missionaries in the book of Acts. Now the last one is deacon. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Now, what is a deacon? Well, a deacon is, in a local church, somebody who is learned, somebody who knows, and I don't have time to to go back to Acts and, and read that, but it's someone who would be a co-helper to the pastor. Now, I don't want to say one's above another or something like that, but the pastor is really the one in charge, but the deacon is, Pastor, whatever help you need as you are in charge, I will help. And so that's really what a deacon is. He's supposed to be a helper. First Timothy chapter 3 and verse 8. Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these that also be first proved, then let them use the office of deacon, being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderous, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife. See, there's no women deacons. It's a man who has a wife. And on and on and on. Uh, so here we have a deacon. As we have a different one here, uh, verse 13, for they that have used the office of a deacon well purchased to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. So being a deacon is supposed to be to be a help to the pastor and a help to the church. Now a lot of people look at it as the modern way we do church. And many times today the modern way we do church is a church has one pastor. Now in the Bible they had many pastors. Elders, plural. Two, three, four, five, I don't know how many. The, the general rule is, in many churches I've been to, the general rule is one deacon per hundred people in the church. I don't know. Some might say 50 people. I don't know how that works. But you got a man who's a pastor, and let's say that pastor of a church has, I don't know, 400 people in his church. What is the pastor supposed to do? Well, he brings a sermon every week, and a midweek sermon usually. So the pastor is busy studying all week, like I do, to try to bring you a good sermon every week, to edify you, to teach you something so that you'll learn. But there are people in that church that need things, and the first person that they'll call is the pastor. Uh, this is very common. What if uh, one of the people in the church, their family member, is in the hospital? Well, they call the pastor. Pastor, so-and-so is in the hospital. I'll be right there. 
And it's usually the responsibility and the job of the pastor to, uh, well, go visit that person and, and, and pray for them. And that's what a lot of pastors do. Um, I was uh, going down to South Florida on vac vacation here a couple weeks ago. And as we're driving down, I look at the phone and uh, there's an email, Brother Breaker, uh, my brother-in-law or somebody is, is in the hospital. And a uh, brother, I think it is. And um, would you go visit them? They're in Milton, Florida. And I'm like, oh no, I'm on my way down from South Florida. I wish I'd gotten this before. I could have gone and visited them. And so I wasn't able to go visit that person. And they said, we want you to give them the gospel. We don't know if they're saved or not. Would you witness to them? Please tell the person. And, and I was like, oh, I want to so bad. So I'm thinking to myself, well, I can't turn the car around. We've had this planned for a while. We're going to be here for about six days. And what what? And so then I thought, oh, brother so-and-so. If I call brother so-and-so, I bet you anything he'd be willing to go do that for me. And so I did. I called him and said, brother, we're in South Florida, but this person needs someone to give the gospel to, to, to this person in the hospital. And Would you mind doing it? I said, oh, if it's for the Lord, I'll do it. I'll do it. And they did. And they went and visited this person and, and shared the gospel with them. And, you know, it's one of those things. We don't know if the person's saved or not. Um, but at least we know that they heard the gospel because my friend um, went there and, and gave them the gospel. And that, you know, what more could you ask than to have somebody that's ready? And, and, they, and my friend told me, he said, look, if it's for the Lord, I'm there. <laughs> and I said, wow. So, I mean, he's got a, a good heart. And, uh, you know, if we had a church like a lot of modern churches do, I bet he'd be a deacon. But um, I'm just very thankful for Christians out there that are willing to do things like that. I can only do so much. So, here's the deacon. Now, there's a lot more verses that I could get into and things like that, but let me say this also, all right? I've told you I'm an independent Baptist. Well, I'm ordained independent Baptist. Um, many years ago, independent Baptist was the way to go, and I guess in some ways it still is, but now we have what they call the new independent fundamental Baptist. Watch out when they start calling things new. you got to watch out for that. And uh, it's kind of weird. The new independent fundamental Baptist, the NIFB, is very critical, very angry, very hateful, very mean. And I don't want anything to do with it. Because all they do is devote their time to attacking other people. And that's not ministering at all. So, I'm an ordained independent Baptist. But I, I'd i rather just say I'm a King James Bible believing, blood-bought saint of God who preaches the Bible. And, and, and because... Like I said, I'm seeing a lot, unfortunately, of people that are independent Baptists going into apostasy. But I'm not going to turn my back on the independent Baptist movement because there's a lot of people in it that are still good, that still love the Lord, and a lot of them are my friends. And they haven't turned into apostasy. They haven't fallen away. And uh, I love them in the Lord, and I appreciate them. So I'm an ordained independent Baptist. Now, there are other kinds of Baptists out there. Now, when I grew up, I grew up in a Southern Baptist church. And uh, Southern Baptist, at least where I'm from, well, actually, a lot of the South, are very bad. I hate to say it. Oh, I, hate to, I, I don't want to talk bad about Southern Baptists. Sure, in the world, somebody here is a Southern Baptist. But let me just tell you my experience with the Southern Baptists, okay? Do you want, just take it with a grain of salt if you want to. But this is a guy that was inside watching it. Many of the Southern Baptist churches, they had a pastor. And the pastor was the man that they voted on, okay? Now, one thing about the Baptist is that they do a lot of voting. And they, they're very... Uh, de democ democracy. Democracy. The one thing that the Baptists over the centuries and over the millennia have done is they believed in a pure democracy. Democracy. It would be nice if I spelled it right. <laughs> democracy. Democracy. And so they would vote in the Southern Baptist Church and in Baptist churches on who would be the new pastor. And all the people would literally pray and fast and say, God, our, our pastor died, we need a new one. Or, or, God, our pastor passed away, and there's this guy coming from over another church, and he would like to be our pastor. And so they vote on who the pastor is. And that's how the Southern Baptists do it. And, well, I think that's supposed to be how the Independent Baptists do it as well. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Well, in the Southern Baptist Church, there were deacons as well as pastors. And one of the things that I saw in the Southern Baptist churches were that many of the deacons were Masons. 
Now, you don't know what a mason is. You need to figure it out. A mason is a person who, who belongs to another denomination or another religion. Masonry is a religion. So I am not a Mason, nor do I want to be. There was a guy named Albert Pike, and he was a Southern Confederate gen general. As soon as the war was over, he pops up in Washington, D.C. and builds a giant Masonic temple. He wrote books about Masonry, and he was an evil man. He used to go around naked in the forest and, and have orgies and do evil, wicked things, this man named Albert Pike. Most of the South, wherever you go and you see a Southern Baptist church, almost always, not always anymore because a lot of times things have changed, but almost always you will see right across the street from the, from the Southern Baptist church, Pike Street. And that's named after Albert Pike. So what has happened is the Masons have infiltrated Southern Baptist churches. And you can go here in Milton, Florida, where we live, and you'll see the most disgusting thing. You come up the street from, from Garson Point Road into Milton, you come to the light. You look right over here, there's the Southern Baptist Church. They are the most sweet, wonderful people in that church. I, I, some of them, I love them to death. But they don't know that there are Masons in that church. And you look over at that church, you look right over here, here's the Masonic Temple, and there's Pike Street right there, just like I'm telling you. And I've been all over America, and I've seen so many Southern Baptist churches. First Baptist Church of such and such, and right across the street, there's Pike Street, named after Albert Pike. Because the Masons have gotten into these places, and the Masons have become the deacons. Sadly, today, a lot of the pastors are Masons. Now, not all. Now, I'll close this with this story. When I was a kid, we went up the road to Baghdad, First Baptist Church of Baghdad, or Baghdad Baptist, I think it's called, and it was Southern Baptist. And I remember as a kid going to that church with my dad, and I remember the pastor named Pastor Dan. And uh, I remember dad talking to my mom and saying, well, talk to, Pastor Dan talked to me today, and uh, he said that they, they want to vote him out of the church. He said that the Masons came to him and said, would you stop preaching about the blood of Jesus? We're sick of hearing about that. He said, I can't stop because that's what the Bible says. And they said, well, Pastor Dan, if you don't do what we say, and it was a group of Masons who were the deacons of the church, we're going to vote you out. Because we're telling you right now, you shut up and stop preaching about the blood of Jesus or you are out of this church. And I remember my dad made a trip up there and sat down with Pastor Dan and talked to him. And I waited out in the car. And then dad came out. And I'm just a little kid, 8, 9, 10, I don't know. Maybe I was closer to 11 or 12. But I remember dad telling uh, mom, well... Pastor Dan said they're going to vote him out if he stops preaching about the blood of Jesus. You see, they wanted a little milksop, lovey-dovey gospel. Because what is masonry? All right, Masonry is the worship of the light bearer. And a lot of masons don't understand or know this. But masonry is the worship of Lucifer. Who is Lucifer? Satan. Satan is the light bearer. Now, masonry has different degrees. So the higher you get up in masonry, the more you understand. So if you're just a first or second or third degree, you don't really know that. But when you start getting up to the 30th and 31st and 32nd and 33rd degree, there is no doubt that by now you've been indoctrinated into understanding what masonry teaches, which is the true God is Lucifer, Satan. Now we have to worship him and his seething energies. And you start reading the books by Masons, and you start reading Albert Pike, and you start reading, uh, who was that guy uh, that wrote that book? Oh, there's so many books. I've got them in my shelf back here. I, I, I go to garage sales, and I find where Masons died, and they got all their books there. Well, if you're a Mason, you're supposed to turn your books in, because they don't want people to find out the truth that Masonry is really the worship of Lucifer. So they try to hide it. But I see them, and I'm like, how much for the book? And I buy it, and I read their books. And it says, Lucifer is the light bearer. Lucifer is really God. And in Masonry, they teach you this. They say, Jesus isn't really God. Lucifer is really the light bearer. And we've all been deceived. It's not really Jesus. So if you are a 30-something degree Mason, you are an enemy of Jesus Christ. And you are an infiltrator into a church trying to deceive people to follow Satan. 
and I got your number. I know who you are. My dad knew who you are. There's a lot of people that know who you are. Even here in town, over in East, in East uh, Milton, there's a church. It's a Southern Baptist church. And I don't agree with everything that that pastor says, but I kind of respect that pastor a little bit because he put out a video against Masons. Because he realized, hey, in my church there were some Masons. And I looked into that, and they're devil worshipers. They're literally worshipers of Satan. And he kicked them out. i got his video over there somewhere, um, and it's all about how Masonry is indeed Luciferianism. It's the worship of Lucifer. And uh, so even though he's not right completely on everything, at least I respect him for that. Because most of your Southern Baptist churches have been taken over by Masons. So let me get back to the story of Dad and, and Pastor Dan. So Dad comes out after talking to Pastor Dan. And Dad, Dad says, well, Pastor Dan is scared. He said the Masons are threatening to uh, vote him out if he continues to preach on the blood. And he asked me, Robert, what should I do? See, my dad's name is Robert also. And my dad looked at Pastor Dan, and this is the story my dad said. My dad said, Dan, you preach the blood of Jesus Christ harder than you ever have. And you tell those bunch of devil worshipers the truth because they just might get saved. And if they don't, at least they'll have no excuse at the judgment. They'll know why they were wrong. It wasn't two weeks later, Pastor Dan was gone. But I do remember that sermon. He preached hard on the blood of Jesus. And I thought that was interesting. You know, at the time I was just a kid and I didn't understand. All I just remember is he said the word blood a lot. <laughs> but they got together and they voted him out. Because they want a bloodless gospel. They want a little milk sop, little teaching of, you know, this, that, or the other thing. They just want a, a, a non-offensive gospel. They don't want the blood of Christ. So I am not a Southern Baptist, and I hate to talk like that. And, and I'm not. people say, oh, you're putting down Southern Baptist. <laughs> no, I'm just telling you that there are a lot of Southern Baptist churches that have been infiltrated by Masons. And they take over as deacons. And a lot of times when they vote in a new pastor, they ask, are you a Mason? And Masons have all these different symbols and signs. One of them is putting their hand in like this. That's a Masonic symbol. You know, people say, what was a Napoleon? Napoleon goes around like this a lot. That's a Masonic symbol. The paw, I think it's called the paw, something like that. That's a Masonic symbol. There's different handshakes that are Masonic handshakes. There's different ways to find out if a person is a Mason. But you better watch out for Masons. They need Jesus. And they have been indoctrinated into believing that Jesus isn't God, Lucifer really is. And that only they know that truth when it's a lie from the pits of hell. And they're going to burn in hell. And they've been sitting in a church their whole life. And they're not getting the truth. And it's really sad to me. So I guess I'll stop there. I went a little long. I hadn't planned to go off onto that tangent. But I want to warn you of Masons. I haven't done a video yet on why I'm not a Mason. I'd like to get to that, but there's just so much to do and so little time, to be honest with you. But there are many, many, many videos on YouTube about Masonry and what it's really about and warning you about it. Um, some will probably ask, well, who was that pastor that you're talking about? Pastor Carl Gallups. He has a show every week on, uh, on the radio, um, Freedom Friday. Like I say, he thinks we're in the tribulation right now. I don't believe that. So I, I don't agree with him 100% on everything, but I do appreciate his his stand against masonry and I think that's great and so uh, well I don't know where that video is that I told you that I had but I know I got it somewhere so if you get a chance um, look up the truth about masonry and try to find out more about that so I'll uh, I'll close there I appreciate you watching God bless you and uh, we'll get back to this here next time as we study more on first Peter Bye-bye.